Thank you, Marjorie, for a very kind introduction. Um, um, I'm looking for my uh, slides. Um, take your hand up there. Here it is. Yeah, okay. Right. Can everyone see it? Right. right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Marjorie, for a very kind introduction. Uh, good morning, everyone, Prof, uh, and all fellow students. Okay, so my topic today is infection and immunity. So what I'm going to do in the next half an hour is actually I'm trying to incorporate basic sciences of the virus and uh, immunology uh, of the infection and try to put it into a clinical perspective. Okay, so please bear with me. Right, so this is my lecture outline. I'm going to talk a little bit on the discovery of the novel virus, um, the disease itself, its pathophysiology, and how the basics of the virus and pathophysiology um, affects our investigations and treatment, and subsequently on the prevention and vaccination. Okay, so we all know the story, where does the disease come from? It started once upon a time in December 2019 in China, in the uh, Hubei city, in the in Hubei province, in a city called Wuhan. Okay, we all know this, when a bunch a cluster of patients were admitted because of pneumonia of unknown cause. And a whole bunch of people are affected, you know, dozens are passed away and thousands more died. And it spread very rapid, causing an epidemic to the whole of China. Soon enough, many more countries picking up the disease. And uh, we found out that uh, this, is called, uh, this is caused by a novel virus called uh, NCOV 2019. At that time, it doesn't have a name yet. But as, for, as of February 2020, WHO now gives a name to it and it's known by now as COVID-19. Okay? And because it's very similar to its elder brother, we know from 2002 uh, Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, SARS virus. So this is deemed as the younger brother, which is the SARS virus 2. And by March 2020, the whole world is affected, including our country, and, and therefore it's announced as a pandemic. Okay, and as we speak, uh, by now 2,200 over countries are affected, with 5.3 million confirmed cases and 300 over thousand patients uh, uh, has, has been passed away. Okay, so what is the virus? Okay, so it's actually an RNA virus. Um, it has a club-like spikes on its surfaces, you know, uh, the club that looks like a crown. That's why the name is Corona, which means crown, um, which means crowns. And it has uh, four genera. It comes from four genera, which is alpha, beta, gamma, and delta. Uh, but the one that is significant to humans, the one that causes infection in humans, is only alpha and beta. Okay, you might not know the rest of... Um, the beta siblings, but you may know the two famous elder brothers, which is the MERS that affect uh, in 2012, MERS virus uh, affect the uh, East, East Asia and the first SARS virus. Okay, and what is more important that we need to know about this virus, it has, it has in the genome, it has five proteins. And these proteins, which, is, um, which are the S, M, N, H, E, and E, are the basis of the investigation. Uh, and, and the pathophysiology of the disease. Okay, so I put here a picture here, which is a, a true picture of electron micrograph of the virus itself. And you can see it's quite homogeneously shaped, which is all mostly round. And it has some spikes on it. That this, is, this is the S spikes. And these are the one that forms the crowns, which I call the coronavirus just now. Okay. So this is the genome, the complete genome of the virus, where you have the S, M, uh, N and E proteins, and this is the receptor binding protein. Uh, more importantly, that we want to know is the ORF polyprotein. Okay, so the NCOV 2019 is a human pathogen. Okay, um, when when these patients were admitted for severe pneumonia in China in late December 2019, they do not know the physicians that are treating the patient do not know what are the cause. So they do a bronchoscopy and take a BAL sample. So from the BAL sample, they study, they do this complicated studies called viral metagenomics, trying to line out what is actually the, uh, where is this virus looks like. 
and they found it's actually something new, something that I've never seen before, and that's why it is a novel virus. However, it looks pretty similar to other the rest of the family, which is coming from coronaviruses. Okay, and 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 where do these virus come from? So we know by now that bats are actually a host, a primary host for 30 coronavirus that has been completely studied before. And this new virus looks similar to it. So they trace, they do all this contact tracing and line listing and found out that, um, look, you know, one of the patients are a regular uh, customer to a market that sells live animals and also um, pagolins, bats and all that. So maybe, maybe this is where it's coming from. Okay, it's a zoonotic disease that has actually transferred into a human host. So for any virus, for any zoonotic disease, the key part of it to become important is when the, the virus, the genome can jump from the animal into a human-to-human -human transmission. Okay? So this is a simplified version. So this is the new virus. Initially, was the primary host is bats. So we don't know whether it's actually direct contact with the bats and then comes to human, jump to human, or because human consume it in the food. And so what happened? The virus mutated, and now the virus doesn't need an animal anymore. It can just transmit between two humans, okay? okay this is the pathophysiology. Bear with me, it looks complicated, but I'm trying to make it easy for you. Okay, so this is the virus here. So the virus, remember, it has an S-spike protein on its membrane. So it binds to H2 receptors of a human cell, okay? So H2 receptor and cause this membrane fusion. So what happened once it enters the cellular organelles, the virus now uncoating, okay? And release its RNA. And this RNA will then be replicated in the human cells until it produces multiple types of protein. And the, the protein will then take up by the cellular endosplasmic reticulum and Golgi apparatus and to become, to, to be translated into mature protein and a full virus genome. And eventually, this virus will then be released to the rest of the cells through a process called exostosis. Okay. So what happened now? How does it translate, how does it transmit from one person to another person? It is believed that it is through uh, mainly respiratory droplets. So respiratory droplets mainly when you cough or you sneeze, you know, when you talk to a person in a very close range uh, or you touch the person and the person is infected so and then you touch your mucous membrane like your eyes or your nose your mouth your ears and it enters your mucous membrane mostly your eyes and your nose and you can get this infection okay and typically droplets should not travel very far it only um, transmit between uh, three to six feet and shouldn't be beyond that okay so um, a lot of papers have also proven that uh, this SARS-2 virus can also be detected in multiple other specimens, not just in your uh, droplets. It can also found in your ocular secretion, which is coming from your eye, from your semen, from your stool and blood. But until now, we cannot prove whether if we detect this virus from your stool, how is it transmit? Whether this, this virus from the stool can actually be transmitted into another person. So can it be airborne? You know, some people sneeze very hard. You know, it spread very far. Can it be airborne? Okay, people are asking. We are scared. You know, should we use surgical masks or should we use um, N95? You know, like like um, tuberculosis. So it's very controversial. Okay, uh, some studies uh, found that this virus is detected in your ventilation system or in uh, you know air system, but when they tried to culture this virus that was detected from the ventilation system, actually this virus cannot be grown in the culture media. So what does that mean? What does that mean? Is it a viable virus? Or is it just a particle of the virus? Or is it actually a dead virus? So we don't know, okay? So there were also reports. Another thing, this is also a report where we don't know the patient is positive. Standing to the patient and not wearing a proper uh, PPE for uh, uh, ventilation, uh, okay, the, the, the aerosolized produce, producing uh, uh, procedures. And then when, when they're being exposed for quite some time to the patient, they realize that, look, they're not exposed. Actually, I also wrote a paper on this and, and, and where a group of our MOs are attending to a patient. At that time, we do not know yet whether this patient is actually having the COVID virus, okay? So they attended the patient, they put nebulizers, they put the patient on NIV, 
and um, so the multiple and then eventually they intubate the patient. And this group of healthcare worker, we tested them three times and turned out that they are still negative for COVID-19 virus. So the question whether it's airborne is still questionable. Yeah. So, however, however, having said that, okay, I still we still recommend that you use um, um, for, for when you're doing a aerosolized procedures like nebulization, we still encourage you all to use a proper PPE. Okay, recommendation for airborne precaution is still uh, um, recommended. Okay, so now if someone is infected, okay, when when I, is this person going to infect another person? Okay, um, so based on the data, by now we know now that uh, for COVID virus, it's actually most infectious before the person has symptoms. So now that's the that's the tricky part, you know, because your friend might be asymptomatic, but that's the time when they're actually infectious. So people are scared because of this. Okay, we should be scared because the person has no symptoms and that's the time when they are actually infectious to other people. So we, we, we from the data collected, we found out that actually infectiousness happened about two days before the symptoms occur. And just before the symptoms, okay, before you become symptomatic, that's the time when it peaks, okay? And subsequently, as you become symptomatic and gets better between seven, within seven days, then the virus become lesser and lesser infectious, okay? And then when they take the samples from the naso and oropharyngeal swab, after the eight days of illness, it's actually no longer infectious, right? So from the patients in the ward, I know you have not been in the ward, but most of the patients in the ward, they've been repeat, we keep repeating swab, okay? Uh, when they become asymptomatic, you know, after like five or seven days, we repeat their swab at 48 hours or 72 hours. And we found they keep turning positive, okay? So this, and some patients stay in the ward up to six weeks and, and they're still positive. But what does that mean? Are they still infectious? Should we be scared? Okay. So we don't know how long a patient can be um, infectious, but we realize although they, they are positive swab, it does not mean they are infectious. It does not mean they can infect other people. Okay. So US CDC also said that after three days, you're getting better. Actually, the viral load is low. Okay. So, in, and similarly, okay, uh, when you take the virus from the upper respiratory symptom, after nine days, um, they found that, that the, the virus is no longer infectious. So, so something closer to home, this is a, sort of an observation done at Hospital Sungai Buloh for their patients. So they, they follow up 14 of their patients, 10 of them which are severe and four mild cases. So they, after discharge the patient, they follow up at day seven, day 14 and day 21. And each follow-up, they take a repeat swap, a nasopharyngeal and oral swap. And if it's positive, they try to grow the sample. And what happened is, all virus samples of these 14 patients are actually negative. Okay? And when they're taking the samples, the patient is already at day, roughly at day 21 of illness. Okay? And even when they follow up and they still take the sample, the patient still positive at 31 days. Okay, if the, even after one month. But remember again, all this culture, the sample might be positive, but the cultures are negative. So what does that mean? It's not viable after 14 days of illness. Okay, So if you're well, you can be discharged, although you can be still positive. Yeah? When we repeat a swap, we know that there is a possibility that you can still be positive. So that's why, Two, three days ago, our Director General of Health declared that, hey, look, you can still discharge people at day 14, although the patient can still be positive. Okay, it caused a major hoo-ha, people are worried, but we have evidence, the scientific evidence saying, look, don't worry, it's not infectious. Okay, so now, how do we diagnose the disease? Of course, we teach all everybody, you must first have clinical suspicion, okay, and with history. You suspect, of course, when the patient has no fever, not when the patient has fever for one month, okay, not when the patient has been fever for two weeks, but usually it's new onset. So it's something acute and you must have a respiratory symptom. Okay, it can be cough, sore throat, or dyspnea. Sometimes patients can come with severe acute respiratory illness. We call them SARI. That's why you heard of SARI screening. So some patients who come with pneumonia, although they do not have epidemiological link, we still screen for COVID-19. Okay. 
And in, in your history, uh, you must ask these epidemiological links. Uh, although by now we know that you know anybody can 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 be, although they might not have this epid link, but as much as possible, there might be an epidemiological exposure. So what are these epidemiological exposure? If you have been this this is this whole true for uh, in in March and April where there's still people who are traveling. So you must ask where did this patient has been traveled to, okay? Or they must be they do they come from a cluster area or high risk area like uh, some congregation. We know there's a um, tablet cluster. We know there's a kenduri cluster. So all these are all um, risks for patients to be getting because they are in close contact. Or is there anybody in their family who have been traveling? or anybody in their family who've been exposed. They can be a doctor as well. They can be a healthcare worker who are exposed to patient and, and, and be in close contact. So what does close contact means by, uh, uh, by public health point of view, by public health definition is that if you are standing or sitting very near to a positive patient, okay, roughly about three feet away for more than 15 minutes without a proper protection, okay? or having direct contact, meaning that you're sharing the same toilet uh, with a positive patient. Okay, so of course, diagnosis will not be complete without a microbiological testing. So this is how we confirm. So you have a suggestive history, okay, and you must confirm it by doing the microbiological testing. And everyone knows it's actually nasal and throat swab, okay? So you take, what are these swab being, what does this swab do? It's actually from a test called nucleic acid amplification test. Okay, um, mainly the method is reverse transcriptase polymerase chain reaction. Okay, there are many ways. There are many uh, kits that detect multiple uh, multiple proteins level. You need at least two. Okay, so that's why I'm talking about the genome just now and the proteins that you need to know because these are the basis of the our RT PCR test. Okay, so we test either the presence of N protein or S protein or RDRP gene. So in UKM, in our hospital, our hospital use targets E antigen and RDRP gene. So sometimes uh, when you see the patient's result, you see indeterminate samples. So indeterminate means either one of these are positive. So we want them to be two positive, two genes positive, to confirm the diagnosis. Okay, I'm not gonna explain the picture, I think it's a bit technical. Okay, you can ask the question later if you're all interested to know how the tests are actually being carried out. So what specimen to send? We may ask this in exam, okay? So please remember, it's not just oropharyngeal and nasopharyngeal swab, okay? If patient is intubated, you can still send tracheal aspirate, okay? And you can also send actually salivary sample. So in a patient that cannot, you know, cannot stand the pain or very low platelet and if they're still very early in the disease, you can still send salivary samples and they have more, a lot more papers are also um, trying to recommend using salivary sample, okay? And of course, the deeper the sample is, okay, like sputum and bronchial alveolar lavage, the better, okay? Then it will yield more positive results. Okay, and again, we detect this antigen, okay, either S or N proteins and uh, other, uh, and the rest of the um, protein areas, uh, like receptor binding domains, your ORF, and, and so on, okay? So we can also do serology tests, which is uh, targeting, uh, testing the IgG, IgA, and IgM, okay? But research are still ongoing about this. And the antibody test, you test it through ELISA and molecular tests. However, if you have presence of antibody, it does not mean you're protected, okay? To know whether you're protected from COVID is actually by testing something that we call neutralizing antibodies. However, it's a bit more complex because it cannot be measured by your conventional serology AC. You have to extract from your IgG and measure the neutralizing antibodies against the COVID-19 virus to know whether you have that protective antibody. Okay, so students like to say in exam, uh, what uh, investigation to send? Serology. Okay, so can we send COVID-19 serology for diagnosis? The answer is no, you cannot because we know for you to develop a serology test positive, time to positive may take some time. So the diagnosis is acute. We want to know the diagnosis now. So the, the, however, the serology may not yet be developed. So we cannot use it for diagnosis because of time to positivity may take some time. 
And sometimes, okay, your antibody may be present up to two months. So you may be infected some one month ago and your antibody may still be positive. It does not mean you're still having an infection, active infection. Okay. So what does positive? However, when you take, take the serology test and it's still positive, what does that mean? Okay. We don't know. The answer is we still don't know that if you have a positive serology, does that mean you're not going to get another infection? Okay. We don't know yet. And if you have the antibody, does it provide immunity? And what is the title to say that you are now safe? Okay. I have been infected before. Does that mean that if I, I'm if I'm exposed to someone who's positive, again I'm gonna be I'm not I'm gonna be covered? Actually, we don't know because we could not we do not know what is the safe level fighter. Okay, and how long this protection may last. And sometimes we know that coronavirus also have other types of coronavirus. So some cross reactivity of the antibodies uh, may happen. Okay. So these are our um, treatment protocol. Uh, I'm not going to run through. This is for me to worry about. But I just want you to know that we have every hospital differs from uh, their protocol. Huh? One to one. Uh, this is our fifth version already. Okay, and uh, it's quite nicely colored, isn't it? Okay. So you can see that the treatment, the initial one, if you are well and asymptomatic, which is category one, is just for observation. Okay, because just like any other viral illnesses, you will get better by yourself. Okay. And sometimes you need treatment and it's either fiv fivipiravir or hydroxychloroquine and so on and so forth. It's very complex. But bear in mind, these are still anecdotal and all drugs are still under research trial. Okay, so remember these slides. Okay, I told you about the pathophysiology before that the virus enters through H2 receptor inhibitors and then it replicates and eventually it's being released. So this is our hydroxychloroquine. Everyone heard of hydroxychloroquine? It acts at the entry level. It acts here, okay, where it in, when the cell enters through the H2 receptor inhibitors, when you take uh, hydroxychloroquine, it increases the cell pH, and therefore the it disrupts the viral uh, replication. And then, when once it enters, let's say you are not on hydroxychloroquine, the virus will be translated into RNAs and eventually will be cleaved at specific protein level by enzyme protease. And that's why we have protease inhibitor, you know, your Caletra, when I teach you about HIV drugs. Is being so you this, and, you, and if you're not on Caletra, it goes on to produce other, uh, viral, uh, other proteins such as the RDRP. And this is where your Remdesivir and your Favipiravir works, your anti-RDRP, okay? However, please bear in mind that these are all theory, okay? This is all in vitro studies. How does it translate into clinical and into patient response? Uh, a different story. Okay. So now, if somebody who's never been infected, how do they protect themselves, okay? Um, so we, for, mass, uh, for mass protection, we need vaccine, okay? And how does vaccine work? To understand how vaccine works, you must first understand your immunity system. Okay, so you have innate and you have adaptive. Innate is what's already there. Okay, when, so I'm going to explain this picture. So when you have a virus entering or your microbial entering the body, it will be taken up by your macrophages. So macrophages will kill off the virus and release the antigen inside. You know, it will release and this antigen will trigger the natural killer cells to kill it. And also at the same time, will be taken up by your dendritic cell. Your dendritic cell will hold the antigen and tells these B and T cells to reproduce into memory T and also natural killer T at the same time trigger your B cell to produce antibodies. Okay, so this is how the vaccine works. So you, it gives you some virus, a weakened virus, and the weakened virus will be taken up by, by your macrophages and the antigen then will taken up by your dendritic cells and eventually, a B cell will produce antibodies again. Okay, so this is that's why I explain here. Virus works by imitating um, infection, and it takes some time for the virus to produce antibody uh, and to fight the infection. Okay, so far that we know, there are five types of vaccine. You know, life attenuated vaccines such as your MMR, your measles, your um, uh, 
uh, chicken pox virus, and then you have inactivated vaccine, toxoid vaccine, uh, taken up from toxin that has been weakened, such as your diphtheria and your uh, tetanus, and the subunit vaccine and conjugate vaccine. But the new thing about vaccine for COVID is that they're trying to make a DNA-based vaccine. Okay, it's something new, right? So what happened is this, they, they taken up the DNA of the virus, put it in the vector called plasmid, and this plasmid is from another organism, inject it to human, okay? And it will be killed off by the, um, the cells, by macrophages and release apoptotic bodies, taken up by your dendritic cells, and dendritic cells will bring it to the lymph node and produce your B and T cells and the antibodies. Basically, that's how the vaccine works. Okay, um, as we speak, there are hundreds of uh, about 114 uh, vaccines are being evaluated by WHO at the moment. Okay, these are the ones that actually has come up to the clinical phase. So all these vaccines, people are hurrying up because it has to, to develop vaccine takes many years. But for COVID-19, people are rushing through and, and, and speeding at 80% uh, normal uh, vaccination production. Okay, so this is probably my last slide. At the end of the day, Okay, at the end of the day, I, this is what I want medical students to learn. Okay, new coronavirus was found and deemed SARS virus 2. Okay, so by understanding the viral genomic structure, you can understand the principle of PCR and serology testing. How does the antiviral treatment work and the vaccination process? Okay, so you make the diagnosis based on your positive um, PCR test coupled with your history. However, until now, there is no real treatment for COVID 19. And for mass immunity vaccination, you need vaccination, although it's still in works at the moment. So eventually, what's best is still prevention. Okay. With that, I end my lecture and I would like to play this video. So please protect yourself, yeah? Although you need to eat sometimes. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Nashma. That was a great insight, right? Okay. I hope we're not so, taking too much time. Uh, I think it's okay. <laughs> so I see a few questions in the Q&A section. We will have them answered at the end of the webinar. Thank you so much again, Dr. Nashma. Thank you, Marjorie. Moving on. Okay. Moving on from science to collaboration. Next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Cosby King. Dr. Cosby King is currently on a sabbatical and reading public policy in the University of Oxford. He is an alumnus of UKM and has the MRCP UK and MPH Berkeley. Originally from Taiping, he has lived in Singapore, Dubai, Shanghai, and Paris, from which he covered more than 90 countries in Asia, Africa, Europe, and the Middle East. After working in hospital Taiping and Garik as a doctor, he has also worked in refugee and disaster relief at places like Nepal and Cambodia, clinical research, and healthcare anti-corruption. Currently, he specializes in health systems, health policies, and global health, and regularly writes for media and think tanks in over six countries. Today, Dr. Kaur will be sharing about global public health and COVID-19. Let's welcome Dr. Kaur. Thank you, Marjorie. Um, before I begin, let me do a quick technology check. Can you all see my slides and you can hear me as well? Yes, we can hear you well, yes, we can. and we can see your slides, Dr. Kors. Thank you. Well, um, thank you, Marjorie. Assalamualaikum semua, and Selamat Hari Raya to everyone. It's really a pleasure to be back here uh, in, an, in a webinar that's organized by UKM. UKM is my alumni, or rather, uh, if my alma mater, and I'm very happy and very proud to be a part of UKM and, uh, and 50 years anniversary for UKM as well. So thank you and congratulations uh, to everyone. And thank you also to some of my former teachers and my former lecturers, or some of whom are here on this call today. So again, I um, wanted to say um, that uh, I think we should all be very proud that uh, UKM, although a pretty young university, only 50 years old, we've done very well in the top 1% of all the universities in the world. And here again, a, a huge note of congratulations uh, to all the teachers, all the lecturers, the professors, and also the students of UKM, because I think uh, without uh, all of us uh, coming together, we will not be able to get uh, to where we are today. So congratulations again to everyone. 
Um, what Najma has done for us just now uh, is to go really in depth into the clinical aspects of uh, COVID. Uh, and she's looked at the, shall we say, the microstructure of one virus. And as Prof. Rostina has mentioned, this invisible particle has really stopped the world. What I'd like to do in the next uh, 20 minutes or so is to talk about the global public health elements of the science collaboration action of COVID. What essentially we will do is to look at one slide, only one slide, but in that slide, it's got a few um, portions uh, that we need to look at. And uh, I'll show you that slide right now where we will look at three things, right? Um, the first part of it, we will look at uh, on the section in blue, we'll spend some time on the definitions of global health. And then we'll move to the red section. We'll talk about the global health actors and who are the people who are making decisions inside global health. And then thirdly, just um, like what Najma has spoken about just now about uh, vaccines, we would use the example of vaccines to deep dive and look at uh, some of the questions uh, that uh, are specific only to the field of vaccines. So we'll do this only on one slide and I'll spend about uh, five okay. minutes or so on uh, each of the boxes, yeah? So oh, okay. five minutes on the blue box, five minutes or so on the red box, and five minutes or so on the green box. Sorry, I think I heard somebody. May I, I hope I can continue. Sorry for this uh, technical interruption. Okay, um, so what we when we talk about global health, um, there may be some overlaps uh, between what is global health and what is public health. And I understand that uh, public health is increasing in importance today. And a lot of people are looking at uh, the importance of public health, not only as uh, a means to protect the security of Malaysia, but also for the medical students out there, a possible career option. What I've done in, in my personal career is actually to move from the field of clinical medicine into public health. And right now I hope to move into public policy. So if you allow me, uh, let me um, explain a little bit the differences between public health or PH and global health or GH. Uh, this is uh, inside uh, the um, box on the left of the screen in blue that says global health. Essentially, what public health means is the measures, the science, the policy, the epidemiology, even the art of improving the health of the population of one country. And in this particular case, we're talking about Malaysia. Um, what public health does and public health practitioners in Malaysia would do, we'll be talking about nutrition programs, clean air programs, clean water programs, vaccination programs, education programs, and these are just five examples of what a public health physician would do in normal peacetime to improve the population of one uh, population health of one country. So when you go, if you're in first or second or third year in UKM right now, as you go through the JKM posting or, or community medicine posting in the fourth year uh, in medical school, you will understand a lot more about public health. Let me move to the second bullet point, which is about global health. Now, global health is actually um, the policies and the signs uh, and the measures that are taken to improve the health of the entire world. And when we say the entire world, we mean 7.7 .7 billion human beings on earth. If you go back a little bit to the idea of public health, it goes back to the idea of what is a nation state. And nation states or countries like Malaysia and Thailand and Singapore, the US, Germany, Japan and China, they are constructs of politics. What I mean to say is, it is arbitrarily decided from historical terms why a country or how a country came into being. So if you take away the idea of artificial borders, because we had Kesultanan Melayu Melaka 400 years ago, and then we had the Kesultanan Majapahit, Palembang, and so on. So these are um, organizations or rather governments uh, that existed a long time ago, and their borders are very different from the borders of Malaysia and Indonesia today. So if you consider that human beings are just one species, meaning homo sapiens, and the homo sapiens species is fighting a virus, in this case, the coronavirus, and we are also fighting other things like climate change and uh, um, policies that are truly global, for example, in terms of transnational economic justice. These are things um, that require all of us to consider that we are one global species. And what does global health do? We fix the world's population's health. But in both public health and global health, and let me move on to my third bullet point, it is not just science. We need science and it's very important to have all the science of it, but we need to consider what are the politics, the economics, the social determinants of health, the history and the geopolitics of the world. Um, and I'll touch about this in a, in a bit later. Let me pick up the idea of social determinants of health. 
um, in medical school and uh, in, in the world of science and the faculty of medicine in UKM and all the other medical faculties around the world, we talk a lot about the science and that it's very crucial and it, it's necessary for us to understand how to fix diseases. But there are also this, shall we say, the non-biological determinants of health. We can talk about pathology and uh, pathophysiology and all that is beautiful. The other components of it would be the social determinants of health, which are the conditions in which you live, grow, and age, and eventually interact with other people as well. If we don't, for example, fix living wage, or we don't, for example, fix uh, the problem of migrant housing, then we will not be able to build enough hospitals for us to manage all the health considerations out there. So I present to you this concept of uh, social determinants of health. You can Google this up, or you will learn about this as well, but I encourage you to read a little bit about it. Let me move on to the final bullet point about global health, just to give you an idea, yeah, the big picture of some collaboration areas in global health. This is not exhaustive, just designed to give you a bit of a flavor for what people talk about when they talk about global health. Some examples would be global health security, which is currently the pandemic that we have right now. Is it enough that we rely on Malaysia's public health system? How is Malaysia integrated with ASEAN's health system? How are we integrated with the World Health Organization's international health regulations? These are some examples of how Malaysia will have to interact with other countries because the security of other countries is as important as a, to the security of Malaysia. So one specific concrete example is um, we have every day 300,000 Malaysians going back and forth from Johor Bahru or Johor to Singapore to work. If any one of them were to have uh, COVID, to bring back COVID from Singapore or to bring COVID to Singapore, given the fact that uh, Dr. Najma has already said that a lot of the people here uh, with COVID are asymptomatic and you can't trace them, what implications will that be for the shall we say, the health security of Malaysia and Singapore, the economics, the politics, and so on. That's one example. Another example would be global access to medicines. And the third example would be equipment standards, or such as uh, ventilators and PPEs and masks and so on. Fourth example, airline safety. So we travel on Malaysia Airlines from one country to another. It's all governed by health and safety regulations to ensure um, that the airlines from any one country that moves between country, uh, the second and the third countries as well will be equally safe. Air quality standards, animal health and zoonosis, antibiotic resistance, these are all examples of the collaboration areas within global health. So there you have it, ladies and gentlemen, a bit of a primer, a uh, taste really, of uh, the difference between public health and global health, and also the, some of the collaboration areas uh, inside global health. Now, I understand you may have some questions, as Marjorie has said just now, please go ahead and type these questions and we'll get to them at the end of the conversation. Allow me, ladies and gentlemen, to move on a little bit to global health actors. And uh, in global health actors, I want to ask you the question, who makes decisions for global health? And if you consider who makes decisions for things like global access to medicines and equipment standards, then the answers are many people. I give some examples over here. The United Nations agencies, uh, I will not go into too much detail, uh, but the World Health Organization is an agency, UNESCO, UNICEF, or World Trade Organization, they are agencies that make decisions for global health. Each of them have their spe specialized and specific uh, tasks, uh, all of which uh, you can uh, read up a lot more about. The second collection of uh, actors yeah, or stakeholders or players in the global health scene, uh, these terms are all interchangeable, are the global non-governmental organizations or global non-profits or global civil societies. Again, these terms are also interchangeable. And there are also philanthropies that are in play in the global health arena. I give some examples, uh, Red Crescent uh, societies in Malaysia or in other countries where they're known as the Red Cross. Médecins Sans Frontières or Doctors Without Borders or MSF, and you may know them uh, for the doctors who work in conflict zones, and they're also considered a, a global health actor as well. We have the Global Fund, which is an example of uh, a public-private partnership, and every year they disperse four billion US dollars worth of funds um, to fund research and programs against HIV, tuberculosis, and malaria. And just, uh, just as an, uh, an example, just to help you compare, the Global Fund every year disperses four billion US dollars. Malaysia's total health budget for Kementerian Kesihatan Malaysia every year is approximately six billion US dollars. So the one organization, Global Fund itself, is two thirds of Malaysia's national health budget. Um, the world's premier example of a philanthropy is the Gates Foundation. 
they have approximately 45, 48 billion US dollars in assets. And every year they disperse about six to seven billion US dollars in terms of programming, mostly in health and some of in education as well. These are some examples of the global NGOs and philanthropies that are acting in global health. There are also governments acting in global health. Yeah, in the third bullet point, I give to you the examples of uh, the Japan government or JICA, Japan International Cooperation Agency, which I respect. DFID or DFID, which is the Department for International Development from the United Kingdom, and USAID or Agency for International Development of the American uh, government. And we've got the various European agencies as well. Some of them are multilateral, some of them are bilateral. Governments are a, a big, a large actor uh, in the global health uh, arena. The fourth group of people who are global health actors are companies. And I give a few examples over here. We're all familiar with the likes of Big Pharma, for example, Pharma. Pfizer and GSK and AstraZeneca. And this is crucial because R&D aside, private pharmaceuticals, big pharma or generics manufacturers, manufacture 99% of all the medicines in the world. There are only uh, perhaps one country in the world, and that's South Africa, that holds a stake uh, in a direct factory. What I mean to say is there's only one government in the world, and that's South Africa, that directly owns a factory that makes drugs. Malaysian's government owns some shares through Kazana, for example, in factories that make medicines. This is true, but we don't directly own the factories. So just Big Pharma itself as a manufacturing powerhouse for the drugs and vaccines that are needed for the world makes them a huge player in global health. But not only pharma, we have big food. And this, uh, I mean, uh, companies like McDonald's uh, with, I don't know, maybe uh, a million burgers sold a day. And uh, they're a huge company in terms of how they act global in global health. Big soda com uh, companies like Coca-Cola, big tobacco um, are also large uh, actors in the global health arena. Large hospital chains, uh, uh, especially in the US uh, and uh, even IHH, which is a Malaysian company, are also a global health actor. And finally, insurance companies. So if you purchase an insurance from Great Eastern or AIA, ultimately it folds up into the insurance schemes uh, or insurance companies of the rest of the world. Um, and these are very large actors in global health, usually having a lot of money. And the final group of global health actors would be the universities and think tanks as well. And uh, um, I might ask you all uh, an additional question. Where are decisions made in the global health landscape? And the answer in reality is where power sits. And where does power sit? It sits in organizations that are well capitalized. So if they have a large amount of money to spend, they're often able to influence the decisions. I'd like to show you all uh, a very brief look at the global health architecture. It is an extremely complicated slide, the, pre the slides will be available to you at the end of the presentation. You can have a look at the, the slide, uh, sorry, the, the um, paper in which it comes. But I, I show you this example of the global health architecture. But even then, this is imperfect. It is imperfect because it is impossible to map all the players in global health. But here you have it a very complex and the, some of them are universities, some of them are United Nations agencies. But the idea is it's a very complex architecture out there. And I've just given you a very small snapshot of the global health architecture. So we, I will not uh, talk about this slide, right? Uh, but just to give you an idea of uh, the complexity of the architecture, allow me to return to um, the box in green. And I understand uh, that you may have questions about global health actors. Uh, we can uh, discuss that in the Q&A section shortly, but allow me in the next five to seven minutes to talk to you a deep dive about one example of vaccines. And that is one important component. Natrua, Dr. Natrua has already uh, spoken about it just now. We've got 100 candidates uh, in the vaccine pipeline. We do not yet, uh, humanity does not yet have a vaccine uh, for the coronavirus group of family of viruses. So what makes us confident uh, that we can get a virus, uh, sorry, a vaccine for the uh, COVID virus right now? And if I ask the overall question, what's the process for Malaysia to get the COVID-19 vaccine if and when it becomes ready in the next two to three years. And here, I divide this into a few very difficult questions, and I'll give you very brief and imperfect answers. The answers are all of the above. The answers are um, always dependent on the research, always dependent on you doing additional reading, and I'm not able at the moment to give you a, a one-size-fits-all answer. So let's get right to it. The first question is, who, where is the research being done, and who's doing it? And the answer is, many places. In the 100 candidates uh, that uh, Najma has uh, shown you about just now, um, it's done generally throughout the world, but I pick a few examples. 
The first one is CEPI, C-E-P-I, which is an, a global health actor called the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness in Initiatives. And they are funding um, the uh, vaccine, many of the vaccine trials uh, in many of the vaccine candidates as well. Gavi, G-A-V-I, or, or the Global Alliance for Vaccines, um, is also another global health actor. They're also funding many of these candidates in many countries. A third group will be the group in Oxford. So some of my colleagues are um, performing some of the research and they appear to be the most advanced. But even Oxford, while doing the research, is partnering AstraZeneca so that AstraZeneca can manufacture the vaccine and Oxford will be able to perform the research so that because they don't have the uh, manufacturing capacity. And the fourth example will be the various uh, vaccines uh, that various other pharma companies are coming up with in various countries. An example will be um, some Chinese pharmaceuticals, some Indian pharmaceuticals, also some US pharmaceuticals. That's where the research is being done. When you consider vaccines in the global health space, you must consider patents. Ultimately, it's a question of prices. Ultimately, it's a question of who sets those prices for the vaccines. And the prices are unfortunately set in countries that are far away from Malaysia. They're certainly not set in Putrajaya. They're certainly not set in the Ministry of Health in Malaysia, even though we are an actor in the global health arena as well. So I might put it to you that a lot of the prices for vaccines will be determined by private companies that hold the licenses and the patents. Here in my uh, bullet point over here about compulsory licensing, I introduce you this term. What if Malaysia were faced with a, uh, um, a vaccine that cost, for example, 200,000 US dollars per dose? This is a crazy idea. So maybe, maybe I'll come up to you with, uh, say, 200 US dollars uh, per vaccine. And there is no even a guarantee that the vaccine will be effective. And then you multiply that by the population of Malaysia, then we're looking at 6 billion US dollars, which is just the entire health budget for Malaysia itself. And then what do we do? Because we simply don't have the money to pay for that. Then the idea of compulsory licensing comes in. Please uh, have a look at uh, some other um, definitions over here, such as TRIPS, T-R-I-P-S, or trade-related intellectual, intellectual property regimes which was signed in Doha in Qatar, the country of Qatar, in 2001, under the World Trade Organization. Essentially, what it means is, if any country were to declare that this is a public health emergency, we will be able to break the patents. But I'm not saying here that we should break patents all the time. In fact, uh, you might imagine that uh, all the countries in the world and all the, shall we say, the low-income countries in the world will break patents all the time. But the answer is actually not true because um, there are, pharma companies give donations, number one. Number two, pharma companies give uh, medicines at very low cost to them. And then number three, there are only very few instances where only three countries or four countries in the world have in the history of the Doha round since 2001, the last 20 years or so, broken patents and compulsorily licensed medicines from pharma companies in order to fight a public health emergency. And I'll give an example of South Africa when they uh, compulsorily licensed uh, several HIV medicines to fight the AIDS epidemic in 2001, 2005. India um, lic compulsorily license some tuberculosis as well as uh, hepatitis C and HIV medicines uh, in order to fight uh, those uh, diseases in their country. Thailand and Malaysia are the other two examples of countries that have actually compulsorily licensed medicines. It's, a, it's not an easy process, but the process is available for us and that's it for patents. Um, and that gives you a bit of a snapshot about vaccines and the prices of it as it relates to global health. Let me move on to the third thing about vaccines. And, and here we're going really deep into vaccines. That's just one example. And all the other examples that I've given of air quality and animal health, there are very various, uh, shall we say, rabbit holes and very deep, um, say, ways that you can explore these concepts. Let's talk about manufacturing. In manufacturing, um, India, for example, provides something like 50% of the world's um, um, medicines, generics and uh, the patented medicines combined. So if India uh, is so pivotal and so important, what if India were unfortunately to have a, a major COVID disaster and their factories shut down? And then the global health security for the entire world will be impacted because Indian factories will not be able to produce the vaccines and the medicines for the rest of the world. Then Malaysia will have to consider, can we use our local manufacturing capacity and build it up 
so that we can manufacture these vaccines uh, that comes from India, because if 50% is shut down, then Malaysia will have to manufacture for ourselves first before we export to our Southeast Asian brothers and sisters. And the next question about global health for the for organizations uh, like the World Health Organization and CEPI and GAVI and Medicines Sans Frontier and uh, the Gates Foundation and the Malaysian government to think about is, how do we manufacture 7.7 .7 billion doses of the vaccines as soon as possible? And that is a very tricky manufacturing question as well. Forget the R&D, forget the patents, just the manufacturing process will take a long time. And by some estimates, 30 million doses, but manufactured by AstraZeneca's production capacity, will take as much as four months. And 30 million doses is only one country's population, that's Malaysia's population, and it takes four months. And imagine if you multiply that by 7.7 .7 billion people, which then gives, you, gives us uh, the uh, fourth problem, which is the distribution. So if you can't get 7.7 .7 billion doses overnight, which country gets it first? Is it AstraZeneca giving it to the United Kingdom, which is not fair, or Sanofi giving it to France, or Roche giving it to uh, Switzerland, or the Indian manufacturers like Chipla and Dr. Reddy giving it to India? What about Malaysia? And where does Malaysia come into the packing order as we decide for the global health priorities or who gets it first? And even within that country, which group gets it first? Should doctors get it first? Should the uh, parents of doctors and nurses and paramedics get it first because we're frontliners? And how do we make these very difficult decisions? Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I've taken about 20 minutes or so just to give you a bit of a snapshot about global health and global health actors and uh, to deep dive into one example of vaccines. If you allow me, um, I will just uh, summarize uh, my, my conversations, right? Uh, by giving you um, a, a question for you to think about. In this particular framework of global health, where are the Asian or Malaysian voices? I, and I put it to you, uh, to all the medical students listening in right now, as you consider your career, um, do well in medicine and learn the science and where possible, consider the public health and the global public health and the global health aspects of the work that you are doing. It is not enough that uh, we work only in hospitals. It is very important that we work in hospitals, but it's also important that doctors um, and nurses and paramedics become appropriately aware that we all have a duty to the global health architecture. And the more Asian voices and the more Malaysian voices we have in this global health framework, the stronger, more diverse and fairer this framework would be. And I might encourage you as you consider your career for the next 40 years to consider that uh, Asian and Malaysian voices needs to be represented uh, in the global health framework. Let me end uh, by saying that um, um, global health is a political choice. Even health in Malaysia is a political choice. It's a political choice because um, if, uh, if we have enough funding in our health system in Kementerian Kesehatan and also the Ministry of Education hospitals, then we'll be able to function well. But the allocation of resources and the allocation of money and the allocation of political priority is health number one, is democracy number one, is uh, education number one. All that is very important. Uh, and I'm not saying one is better than the other. What I'm saying is health and global health remains a quite the political choice. So I invite you to uh, perhaps uh, consider, um, consider the questions I have asked you, which is uh, whether the Asian and Malaysian voices uh, as we consider global health and cons you consider your career in the next 30 to 40 years. Um, so I, I give you two links uh, to end if I may. The first one is uh, my Twitter account uh, and ha happy for you to have a look at it and uh, to, to enter the conversation with me as we consider health in Malaysia and also globally. And secondly, to introduce you to the Malaysian Health Coalition. We have 47 organizations and uh, um, societies already inside the Malaysian Health Coalition. We're only about two to three months old. And what we'd like to do is to raise health higher on the political agenda for Malaysia so that we can protect the health of the Rakyat. Um, Marjorie, thank you very much again for the time and I wish everybody Selamat Hari Raya. Again, Marjorie, over to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Carr. It was really informative. Thank you. Okay. So having heard about global collaboration, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Sylvana Nair, who will be sharing a talk as a medical student on the impact of the pandemic and what we as medical students can contribute in the broad term collaborative actions as mentioned by Dr. Carr earlier. Ms. Subana is a third year medical student of UKM from Suramban and also a colleague of mine. She has been actively involved in a myriad of extracurricular activities. As the former co-chair and vice president of Malaysian Medics International MMI and was the ex-student executive council member 
or more commonly known as MEP, holding the portfolio of Entrepreneurship and Alumni Affairs. She has participated in Model United Nations Conference and is still actively involved with AFS Malaysia. Savannah so will be sharing her talks as a medical student during the pandemic. Let's hear from Savannah. All right, hello everyone. Uh, thank you Marjorie for the kind introduction. So before I start, let me share my screen. All right. One second. Is it on a full screen mode yet? Belum lagi. Kena, kena, uh, okay, sekarang okay. Okay. So everyone can hear me? Yep. All right. Okay. Uh, so thank you once again, Marjorie, for the kind introduction and a uh, very good morning to everyone who's tuning in to the webinar today. Um, so once again, I'm Shobana Nair, a third year medical student, and thank you very much to the faculty and also to Persia for giving me this opportunity to actually represent all the medical students of UKM. So before I start, I would like to give you like an insight of um, my talk. So I have like a few things lined up for you. So first thing is uh, I will talk about the new normal and then also the issues and challenges faced by students. And then uh, how is Malaysia different from abroad? And then um, why are we actually not allowed at the hospital? So this is something that is uh, very worrying for all the students out there, I'm pretty sure. And also, um, so how can we make use of the resources while we can? And also uh, the global collaboration in learning, just a bit on that. All right, so the new normal. Everybody has been talking about the new normal right now. So as for us, the students, we actually have this concern, like um, how do we practice to become doctors? Um, are we actually competent enough? Because like um, currently we are being suspended from physical classes and also ward work. This is something very worrying for us, especially the clinical students and as well the preclinical students who are unable to actually learn uh, in the normal setting and also go on for their uh, CSL classes. So um, medical education is now online, so something that is very new for all of us and uh, we're just trying our best to fit in with the new normal. And then also there's uh, another question that is coming up where whether is knowledge alone sufficient. So this has been the concern of public and also our family members out there, because um, a lot of people are thinking that this is a missed opportunity for first-hand experience in handling a pandemic. So everybody has been talking like, oh, okay, so if you're studying alone at home, just the theoretical part, how is it um, going to help you? Will you will you be a good doctor in the future? So these are the questions that arise in our minds and also in our parents and people around us. So um, some of the few things that has been going on, um, like the clinical skill and assessment has been replaced online. But for us, not very much of uh, the assessment, but a few quizzes are replaced online. So we are actually worried of the assessment and also the outcome of how is this going to um, work and uh, how is our results going to be like with all this online uh, education and online assessment and also um, we have to admit that there's actually extra work for our educators to create new methods of assessment. So our, our educators, while they're also doctors in the hospital, they're actually very busy with all this COVID-19 and they actually have extra burden, I would say, well, they have to actually crack their heads and actually think of a way for us to um, do an assessment online. And then next would be uh, bedside teachings are now virtual cases. Well, uh, not all of us are actually uh, going through the virtual cases, I must say, but then um, that's just an opportunity out there for us to go through the virtual cases. But uh, if you ask me, I would say um, virtual cases can't replace the real life patients, of course. And also we have reduced time in the wards and also exposure to the real life patient. So we lack exposure in examining patients and eliciting the clinical findings, especially us, the third year medical students who are actually new in the um, ward setting and it's something really new for us and we, we were supposed to learn practice and learn from the patients but well the situation is such and we are now online. So um, I, will, I will now talk a bit more on the issues and challenges faced by medical students out there. So two main issues that I feel I would like to address over here would be one is the internet connectivity and second would be the mental health problems. 
So um, in terms of internet connectivity, so let me go further. So the problem is now that students with poor internet connection, so those students who are actually back home, uh, those who live in remote areas or certain areas where it has like poor internet connection, so they're unable to attend online classes consistently. So um, this actually jeopardizes their learning process and also, um, you know, they can't actually keep up with the classes going on online. And also I have to address that certain students are actually placed at the quarantine centers right now. Um, not to say that all quarantine centers have a uh, weak internet connection, because I, I have friends who are placed in the quarantine centers, some of them have really good connection, but then some of them um, somewhat have a weaker connection than the other. So, well, thank you UKM, I must address here that uh, we actually have this free 40 GB data that has been uh, given to us for, it's an initiative for students of UKM, so that we actually have, right now we can actually apply for this and we can uh, access internet freely. So with all this internet connectivity problem that is going on, I feel that, like personally, I feel uh, medical students actually uh, begin to care for one another. Well, not to say that uh, we have never been caring for each other while we were in the hospital. Yes, we do care for each other. But then like while we are at home, um, being in different locations, I feel that there is extra care for one another. So like, for example, certain things that um, me, myself, and also my friends out there have been doing for other friends who are unable to attend classes. So we actually record audios or videos for friends. And then we actually uh, work on like continuous studying among our peers using all these online platforms we have like Zoom uh, or even WhatsApp, like some, some simple discussion uh, online. And then um, also we check on each other's welfare. Like when I say welfare, um, it doesn't have to be like um, you have to fund somebody with money or something, but a simple act like, um, you know, calling a friend and saying, asking, how are you doing? Uh, some of our friends are still at the campus um, and just by just giving them a call and talking to them, it will, it will definitely lift their burden and make them feel better. All right, the next problem would be a mental health issue. So I have a question for everyone right here. So with all this COVID-19 that is going on, and then we have this mental health issue coming up. So will it still remain as a stigma? So well, um, we've seen a lot of people uh, talking about mental health already, which is something really good. I feel that um, this is something worth talking about and addressing. And of course, uh, going to find the uh, right solutions from the right people. All right, so fear and anxiety of COVID-19. Why? Why is this um, mental health problems uh, happening during this COVID-19? So certain, um, I have a few reasons here uh, laid out for you guys, why people are actually feeling, um, feeling very anxious about um, being in this uh, COVID-19 MCO. And now we are currently in the CMCO, although we can go out, but uh, there's still some restrictions out there. So um, what, a few reasons could be because uh, we lack information or facts on COVID-19. And then there's also rumors of fake news being spread out and also like influence of social media. People are posting a lot of stuff out there. So we are not too sure whether these are true or these are false. So um, it's, it's up to us now to actually analyze, I would say. And then also we have a uh, fear of not being able to cope with medical education. This is something very relevant to all of us. And I'm sure all the uh, final year students especially would be uh, very much anxious about all this. And um, they'll be thinking like, oh, I have my professional exam coming up. Well, the third year as well, we have the professional exam too, but the fifth years um, are just like still um, in the state of like dilemma, whether they'll be graduating on time or not and also increased stress for not uh, being able to perform outdoor activities for those who are pretty active, those who love jogging and all these things, and then uh, worry and anxiety of not being able to physically present to help loved ones, and also uh, the just like feeling helpless, um, feeling bored, uh, loneliness, and also eventually depression can also set in. So just a few data I would like to share on mental health status. So. Um, this is kind of wordy, but I'll just put it out there for you guys to see. So the American Institute of Stress reveals that 52% of Gen Z Americans have been diagnosed with mental health issues during this pandemic. 
And then also there's another study done uh, by the Department of Nursing and Faculty of Sports Education and Health by the Universitas Pendidikan Indonesia. Uh, it's reported that 24.9% of students experience anxiety during this outbreak. And also uh, in China, they conducted uh, a prospective cohort study involving uh, 1,442 health professional students. And it stated that uh, 26.63 demonstrated a significant uh, number of psychological distress and 11.1 met the criteria for the probable acute stress reaction. Well, those are all the um, studies done uh, abroad and also there's studies done in Malaysia as well, but it's more of a, a general data. I, I wasn't able to find like a proper data on specifically for the um, health professional students. So looking at this, we can actually like, I, I can pretty much conclude that definitely this COVID-19 situation has put us all in some um, minimal stress, I would say, uh, thinking about how the future would be, how are we going to cope and how the study is going to be like in the future. So I have a few ways to improve your mental health. This is something really important I would like to address is first, um, those are just simple acts, I would say, that I've lined up here for you. Um, First, you can just uh, form peer groups or support groups to talk or share problems. Well, uh, I know a lot of people out there are actually, um, you know, you love to keep the problems to yourself and not share to anyone. But trust me, um, you will have like one or two friends or maybe a family member that you're very comfortable that you can actually share, like sharing actually um, makes you feel better, trust me. And also, uh, you can just reflect on your own weaknesses and use this lockdown as an opportunity to learn and grow. Like, if you, if you have figured out, like, you have, you're weak in something or you have this weakness of controlling emotions or something like that. So use this uh, lockdown or this MCO as an opportunity for you to learn and also, like, um, look up various sources for you to grow uh, to be a better person. And something very simple that you could do is just, just take breaks in between and relax because uh, all you need to do is just take a break sometimes because you can't be studying all the time or you can't be doing something continuously. All you need is just a bit of break, maybe like a 20 minute studying and then like a five minute break because I personally have very short, uh, ex um, how do I say, short uh, uh, times when that I can actually concentrate. So I usually take a short breaks uh, often, I would say. And also you can implement new techniques for mental health strength and also think out of the box. So every problem has a solution, right? So it's just up to us to whether you want to uh, take a step and improve your condition. And um, very simple, uh, if you really can't handle your problems already. So Ministry of Health together with Mercy Malaysia they have actually uh, done a very noble act where they have provided uh, everyone the access to uh, qualified mental health first aiders and offer practical support to those who need help in dealing with the anxiety during this COVID-19. So um, friends out there, uh, if you really can't handle your problems or um, you, you think you need some help, don't, don't feel low, uh, just, just go to this hotline, just make a call and probably you have the professionals to help you out. All right, so next, something very interesting. Uh, these are the thoughts that are in medical students' minds right now. Like um, I have been hearing this continuously, um, things that I've been talking with my friends, me, myself, have this thought. Um, so it's like, when we will return to the hospital or campus, will clinical rotations, the CSL for preclinical students and OSCEs not take place anymore? And also like uh, another concern is why are we kept away from hospitals? Aren't we supposed to be, to, be uh, to learn how patients are being treated? Like, because this is a pandemic, like, oh, once in a lifetime opportunity, we are supposed to learn, like, why are we not out there? And also like, uh, we have this concern when medical students abroad can volunteer at their hospitals, then why are we under like lockdown or why are we under a movement control order? Why are we not out there to help? Like, I want to help, I want to learn. So this is something that has been going on in everyone's mind. So just, uh, I would like to just go through a bit on what uh, the medical students out there in the other countries have been doing so far. So in Italy, uh, they fast-tracked 10,000 um, medical students to join further colleagues in healthcare to com combat the COVID-19. 
Well, in the United States of America, um, Harvard Medical School, New York University, and Boston University, like a few medical schools actually offered early graduation to medical students just because they could serve in the healthcare facilities. And then in Germany, uh, medical students are allowed to volunteer at the hospital to record symptoms of people being tested and also to collect samples from the suspected patients. Well, just to make you feel a bit better, well, in China, China has the same rule as us, where medical students are sent home due to shortage of PPE and lack of experience. So there's a lot of countries, they have different rules and they have uh, reasons for doing so. So uh, I think that uh, something that I would like to um, get all the medical students to think and actually analyze why actually medical students are not allowed at the hospitals in Malaysia. There must be a reason, right? Why the government is doing so? Why are the medical schools doing so? So, <coughs> sorry. So there's, um, so this COVID-19 is a highly contagious pandemic and also students may contract the disease and about 76 of the patients are still asymptomatic. So like what Dr. Najma said, there's still a lot of like gray areas here and there in terms of the disease earlier. And also we lack the diagnostic tools and also we lack the, the personal protective equipment to protect our students. So I must say that the risk and also the cost will outweigh the benefits. And our job now is to just make use of the resources while we can. So it's now up to us. How are we going to cope with the situation, with all these issues and challenges, with all these uh, problems and uh, restrictions out there, so many things out there. So it's just up to us how we want to make use of the resources while we can. So just see the bright side. So we are able to learn anytime, anywhere, because now it's online. So most students are audience at one time. So like, for example, even this webinar, there's a lot of people tuning in right now. And, you know, there's a lot of resources out there for us to actually learn. And just imagine if you were in the classroom setting, only a specific students will be able to receive the information but then now it's like online everyone can watch it everyone can benefit from it and the knowledge has been disseminated to a wider group of people and we have various options like i said earlier so now what are the few things that you can actually do while you are on this movement control order so you can actually enroll in like free online classes and courses like um, it can be COVID-19 related or other health issues. And also uh, there's um, a link that was shared to all of us. I, I hope most of you guys have received them, which is uh, the Harvard Medical School has actually offered um, a lot of free courses that you can actually sign up and you can um, do those while you're under this uh, MCO. And also uh, you can revisit weaker subjects. This is something very uh, simple. Maybe you don't uh, need that many resources. You can probably just use your books or use the online sources like videos to improve on certain subjects that you were actually uh, pretty weak on. And since you have more time, so you can actually do those slow and steady at your own pace um, to study and learn something that you have missed out earlier. And also there's uh, some, some um, resources out there, it's called the DXR clinician. So um, where there's virtual patients and cases to practice your skills while you're at home. And also you can work on the research or literature review. I've, um, I personally have heard uh, stories from our seniors that they're actually working on um, this research and also some literature reviews out there during this uh, MCO. So uh, medical students, it's important for us to stay relevant and updated with the current issues. <coughs> Sorry. All right, so then um, other things that you can do is actually just simple act like spreading awareness on social media. So when you share something, it's very important for you to actually know that you're sharing from validated sources only. So like how our um, government has actually shared, like, you know, hashtag tidak pasti jangan kongsi. So, when you're actually sure of certain information, then you share. So let everyone benefit during this um, MCO. And also you can actually do something very different. Not necessarily you have to do something that is medical related or education related. Just go learn something new, like new language or pick up a new talent, like take up online courses and improve your skills. So you can actually like improve. It's just for your self-development, I must say. <coughs> Sorry about that. All right. So I will continue further. This is something I would like to share. 
um, this is something that I've started uh, for the past 30 days. I've put on hold for this past few days. So I've been sharing uh, health facts from WHO on my Instagram and also Facebook story every day. So one day I'll pick one poster from the WHO website and I'll share it on my Instagram and the Facebook story. So initially, this was just to um, <coughs> just to make my um, MCO period a little bit more beneficial, I would say, because I was seeing a lot of people sharing a lot of fun stuff. So I was thinking, oh, not only sharing fun stuff, we can actually just share something that is beneficial for everyone. And I've received a lot of feedback from my friends um, saying that they have actually benefited from my sharing. And also it makes you feel good when people actually give you suggestions on what they would like to know more. So I've been trying to accommodate their um, um, queries and also sharing what I can, but I still have a few that I have not shared to friends out there. So I guess I should still continue doing so. And then next us a few acts that have been done. Um, so the picture on the right uh, is actually uh, our medical student so um, senior uh, Mohan in year four and also his brother Suhan in year two so uh, they have been preparing these uh, facials like over three three thousand facials I must say they have been preparing with their mother and distributing it out there to um, to the frontliners and also to the health facilities that require them and also these are a few pictures like um mentioned earlier by dr Cole that uh you know you have these global actors like the red cross and society so these pictures are from uh this is my teacher uh my high school teacher miss uh, um who is um the president of the negri Sembilan uh, chapter in the red cross and society so they also have been preparing the face shields and also um preparing some basic supplies for the people out there who are in need. So maybe we uh, medical students can actually go and volunteer out there. Like personally, I have not uh, gone out. I must admit that I have not gone out to volunteer, but then now since it's already CMCO, so I think I might consider doing so since I can actually go out and volunteer. So this is something that you can think about and try on out there. And then some fun stuff. All of these are medical students. Um, some are my classmates and some are uh, my seniors. So just some simple things that you can do, like fun stuff. Um, who said you have to do education stuff only? So go out there and pick up something fun that you would always wanted to do, but you never had the time back in uh, college, back in hostel. So now you have the time, so why not? So I have my friend Shazia. So she has been doing uh, this like a... Uh, video on uh, ischemic heart disease as requested by her doctor. Um, so she put in a lot of effort to actually put in some technical stuff in it. And um, yeah, she has improved on her videography skills, I must say. And also Sabrina she, here, she has uh, been working on her painting skills. And also um, she's been working on her elect, uh, elective posting at the same time. And then we have our senior Charlotte, she has been practicing dance and posting some fun videos together with her sister. So yeah, a lot of fun stuff that you can do while in lockdown. So yeah, take a chill pill, everyone. <laughs> and then um, now it's just um, a bit to, co to co consider over here. Uh, I would like to share on how to foster global collaboration in learning during this COVID-19 lockdown. So um, certain countries are in complete lockdown. Like for us, we are in the control movement order where we have certain restrictions, certain things we are not restricted to do. So um, how can we make use of this opportunity to learn? So these are a few examples that I would like to share. And I'm personally involved uh, in these groups. Like, so there's a lot of public groups on Facebook, like Students Against COVID-19. So this is a a uh, Facebook public group to disseminate up-to-date and correct facts on COVID-19. So there's a lot of students are sharing information and keeping them, uh, keeping each other updated and making sure that those uh, uh, validated resources out there. And also there's this society called um, International Student Surgical Network. So members from around the world, they have joined in a committee to raise COVID-19 awareness. And also uh, there's this thing called uh, Open WHO website where I personally have also taken one of the course here, which is uh, on the uh, operation planning guidelines and COVID-19 uh, 
preparedness and response. So the, in this website, there's a lot of um, health related uh, courses that you can actually take up and also learn from how things are being done in different countries and just, just uh, empower yourself and keep learning because we as medical students, our job is to always stay updated and keep learning every single day, every time. So um, there's no room to say that we have no, uh, no time or no resources. So we just have to just make use of what we have. So I've come to the end of my presentation. So I would like to uh, end with a quote. Uh, it may be stormy now, but rain doesn't last forever. So no one knew that 2020 was going to put us in this situation that we are in right now. But one thing we do know is that new challenges require new skills for us to continue to grow, to find answers and to adapt and to adjust. So uh, to adjust. So now every single experience or hardship that we go through, um, like, like we are currently, our situation right now, we medical students, and we have this choice to either find strength and take responsibility to either empower us or to dwell into the sorrow and keep thinking, why is this happening? Like, why when I'm in medical school, this is happening? Why not later? Why not before? So um, it is just up to us to decide whether we want to feel empowered or we want to feel defeated. So I leave the choice to you guys. The choice is yours to make. And with that, I thank you. Uh, back to you, Marjorie. Thank you, Sava. Thank you so much. I think we are on the same sheet right now. And I want to thank the faculty for giving us the opportunity to improvise our elective posting for the third year. Okay. So again, I would like to say thank you to all three of our speakers for sharing superb info. So ladies and gentlemen, we have received all of your questions. Some have been answered and we shall try to answer as many as possible for the rest. It would be great if all three speakers uh, can switch on your mic when the questions are directed to you. <clears throat> so I think we will go with the very first one. I think it is suitable for Dr. Nashua to answer this question. So how long do we need to know the result of RT-TTR, Dr. Nashua? Um. Okay, it varies. Uh, in HTTM, we're still lucky because we managed to get the result within a day. So the whole test takes about six to seven hours and uh, plus verification. So um, yeah, but if you're doing it in uh, other labs, uh, it depends, it varies uh, lab to lab, uh, depending on the uh, resources. So if you're sending the sample to MKAK, it may take up to 72 hours to get the result. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Nasha. Mm -hmm. I think that answers for another question that also asked why is the vaccine taking a long time? Oh, it was answered before. Is it? Okay. So uh, there is another question for Dr. Nashmar. Uh, Dr. Nashmar, there is a question that states that since all the treatments are still under research trials, there would be a protocol of opinion concerns from the patient. So is there any difference of consent approach for treatment for a health crisis as what we are having right now? And also, are there any instances where patients refuse to participate? Okay, so basically, uh, what we are using is anecdotal. Uh, consent is only needed when they are on actually conducting studies. So um, for our patients, because it's already make it, make it into the guidelines, um, and, and, and everyone knows there's no real treatment and the treatment are actually based on the previous management of uh, COVID, uh, sorry, SARS-1 and MERS. Uh, so it has been used and it's not considered as part of the study. So we actually do not take consent to start. Uh, having said that, most of our patients, 80% of patients with COVID-19, they actually get better by themselves because it's mostly mild disease and it's viral illness. Uh, only about 15% uh, of these patients, uh, especially those with risk factors, who are actually eventually need uh, therapy. So um, unless they're actually uh, recruited as part of studies, we don't actually take consent. And uh, we, we actually, but we tell them, uh, we tell the patient that actually these treatments are actually in the guideline based on the previous uh, management of um, SARS and MERS. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Dr. Nashma. So the guidelines are also but always changing, right? Just like yep. this version. Mm. Okay. So we have to keep up to date with that. Thank you so much, Dr. Nashima. 
Okay, so uh, I'd like to have Dr. Kaur for the next question. So this is by Prof. Rosna. So I have contradict opinion with first panelists. Uh, oh, sorry. I think the question is directed to me, right? Uh, yeah, Dr. Nashma. Yeah. There so, was uh, a question. Okay. Yeah, Dr. Nashma, is it okay if you can answer this question? It's quite sure, long. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, actually, that's why I'm saying whether or not uh, COVID can still be airborne is quite controversial. People have tried to uh, sampling from the ventilation system and from the air. Uh, and they also test the patient's formites and found that you know uh, this, this virus actually travels a little bit more than uh, uh, two meters uh, range. Um, however, uh, when they tried to culture, uh, these, these viruses are still not culturable. So uh, to answer this question, actually WHO stands still uh, that uh, it's not airborne. And, and uh, however, when you're doing aerosolized procedures, they still encourage that people are taking airborne precaution. So whether or not this is uh, droplets or airborne are still very much uh, in debate. It's still in debate. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Nashma. Okay, uh, Dr. Kaur, uh, there's a question that was posted at 10.14 a.m. I'm not really sure if I can direct the question directly to you. But uh, there are three questions attached. So it's states that uh, one of it is what's your thought on the decision of WHO to declare pandemic only after more than 100 countries are affected? And there are two other questions below. Is it okay if you answer all of them? Sure, thank you. Um, thanks for the question. Uh, at least now my slides uh, don't have to be in full screen, right? Because I have no slides. Um, the first question is, uh, what, what are my thoughts about the decision of World Health Organization to declare the pandemic only after more than 100 countries are affected? Um, I thought they did the best that they could. This is my um, final statement about this, but let me elaborate a little bit. It is not easy for Dr. Tedros or the entire World Health Organization architecture to decide pandemic or no pandemic or public health emergency of international concern or no BHEIC because these decisions are very gray. Uh, there is no manual to say uh, if it's more than 50, it's a pandemic. If it's less than 50, it's not a pandemic. And what is 50? 50 countries, but then different countries have different population sizes. And then there's a different r naught for the virus. There's a different uh, transmissibility and the patterns and so on. What I'm introducing is the large number of variables uh, that uh, will have to be um, considered when we make a decision for whether or not we call it a pandemic. Um, one more thing about history is to say that uh, in 2000, uh, the international health regulations yeah, were passed in 2005. SARS happened in 2003. They passed the IHR in 2005. And uh, since then, the world has declared a five PHEICs. Some of those PHEICs, the, the World Health Organization were criticized, was criticized uh, for declaring it too late. Some PHEICs, the World Health Organization was uh, criticized for declaring it too early. So no matter when you declare it, pandemic or no pandemic, too late or too early, it was bound to have criticisms. So I thought in general terms, that they did the best that they could. This is my answer to question one. Um, the second one is to talk about, uh, sorry, Marjorie, would you like me to continue on with question two and three? Yes, please. Sure, thanks. The, the second one is uh, any, question, any ways yeah, for countries to share data openly? Uh, my answer is uh, yes, there are many, um, but this requires trust and this requires neutrality. Uh, when I say trust and neutrality, uh, like it or not, I think the world might be going through a, an era of superpower rivalry between America and the US. Sorry, uh, America and China. Sorry, sorry for that. Um, so in this uh, era of a superpower rivalry, uh, it's important uh, that uh, scientists around the world don't have to choose between one or the other country. So we need a very neutral body that can act as a repository for all this information. I offer some ideas for a neutral body. The European Union could be considered, and the associations of the European Union, yeah, the European community, uh, universities in Europe, could be considered, shall we say, a neutral body. The second neutral body would be the United Nations agencies. The third neutral body would be think tanks uh, that are situated, or universities that are situated outside of these two countries. So I think um, there are many avenues, uh, but trust and neutrality will be very important. The third question is, uh, what are my thoughts about a the conspiracy theory? It is false. Thank you, Marjorie. Go back to you. Thank you so much. Uh, is it okay if I read out the question for the third question? Because I don't think that the audience know what is it. Sure. Okay. So the third question uh, that was by an anonymous attendee stated, 
what your thoughts on conspiracy theory that this virus is man-made or let me in Wuhan and aided by USA. So I think that has been answered by Dr. Carr. Thank you so much, Dr. Carr. Okay. Uh, next, there is a question that actually came from uh, attendee Hazira Zakaria. So recently WHO released a question that the use of hydroxychloroquine is not recommended in treating COVID patients where the Malaysia stand in administering uh, hydroxychloroquine as part of COVID treatment. Uh, maybe Dr. Nashma would like to answer this question. Thank you, Majri. Yes, um, um, actually to begin with, the hydroxychloroquine treatment for um, COVID-19 is, like I've mentioned before, is actually based on the, uh, the, the studies done for MERS and uh, SARS patients. Um, so and also theoretical, uh, theoretical on on how it may work in vitro, um, and 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 when they conducted the to real patients for COVID, it's actually open level, non randomized trial, and it's small studies. So uh, it's all anecdotal, and and uh, by now after three four months of uh, starting this treatment on COVID patients, uh, recently Lancet uh, produced a paper uh, that is looking at all the countries testing this hydroxychloroquine for uh, COVID patients and, and, and look into the results. And what they found that uh, most patients, either or not, is being used in macrolide uh, combination, meaning that hydroxychloroquine or chloroquine plus uh, azithromycin. Uh, and they found that there are a lot more uh, side effects associated uh, with the use of hydroxychloroquine uh, in comparison to patients who are not on uh, hydroxychloroquine. Uh, they, they, they found that the mortality is higher, especially when used in combination. Either you're using as monotherapy or in combination, the mortalities are higher. And, it, and they have already excluded other uh, possibilities of uh, uh, the mortality, such as the uh, age and, and cardiovascular risk factors. So that is why uh, I think uh, the WHO is going towards um, uh, not trying to use uh, hydroxychloroquine. However, it has not been made as a policy. So our country are still um, debating whether or not to continue using hydroxychloroquine for our patients as our mortality data has not proven uh, that we have increased number of uh, uh, arrhythmias uh, secondary to using uh, these drugs. So yeah, we are, we are still, uh, because it's very recent paper, so we are still discussing about it, uh, whether or not uh, to, to continue using or not to continue uh, use uh, hydroxychloroquine. Thank you for the question. It's actually a, a difficult question actually for us, uh, ID physicians, yeah. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Nahima. Uh, is it okay if you answer another question? That is, uh, is Malaysia somehow involved in the vaccine production for COVID-19? Um, I think that the core would be the better person to answer this. Um, um, I, I, yeah, I, I, based on what I looked through uh, at a glance at the WHO uh, reviewing all the vaccines that have been sent to them, I'm not sure if Malaysia is part of it. Yeah, but I think Dr. Ko has probably the better answer. Thank you, Nashwan. You're very kind. Um, it's a question about uh, production or research. Production. The question actually. Uh, so you, you Production. Mm, so it means that uh, then uh, does Malaysia have factories that are capable of manufacturing a vaccine? Um, is Malaysia involved today uh, for any vaccine trials and research and development for COVID? No, we don't. Does Malaysia today have any factories capable of manufacturing vaccines? Yes, we do. Do we have enough capacity to manufacture vaccines in a hurry for 30 million Malaysians? No, we don't. <laughs> that was very precise. Thank you so much, Dr. Kaur. I hope this answered the question that was given earlier. Okay, so there is a question from Prof. Asni. So, uh, about cytokine storm that occurred among elderly with poorer immune system, poor immune system should not be able to or less reaction to any infection. So was that an answer or <laughs> a question? Uh, I do you agree? Uh, I look at uh, this yes. question, Marjorie, but uh, I'm not too sure uh, what the question um, uh, really asking? Um, I think I think the, the 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 person who asked the question is wondering whether a person a patient with a, a with poorer immune system able to mount a cytokine storm. I think that's that's what they're trying to ask. Uh, yeah. Um, so the question is yes. 
uh, but whether or not they produce less or more cytokine storm, that I wouldn't know because I think uh, the immune system varies from one person to another. Um, yeah, but COVID-19, the severe ones, why patients develop severe COVID-19 is mostly associated with uh, cytokine storm because we know um, uh, it's just like dengue. Sometimes you can have over, uh, overwhelming, uh, overwhelming inflammatory reaction and, and, and this leads to a cytokine storm. And, and that is why the treatment for stage four and five are mostly associated, mostly we're using mobilitis to sort of like um, suppress and disrupt uh, the immune pro-inflammatory and uh, anti-inflammatory pathways while giving time to the clinicians and physicians to provide uh, the supportive care. Uh, so, but whether or not, uh, if you have lesser immune system and therefore you have uh, overwhelming, that uh, I think we should, um, I'm not too sure, I think we should release the question to the uh, expert, the immunologist. But we also seen uh, some patients with uh, hematological conditions uh, uh, develop uh, all these problems as well. So, uh, yeah. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Najma, for clarifying. <laughs> okay, next we will have a question uh, from our dean, from Raja Fendi. So he asked, what is the algorithm to be an outstanding public health expert? Maybe we can have Dr. Kaur <laughs> to answer this question. Salam, Prof. Raja. Thanks for the question. Um, I, I appreciate I appreciate the, the question about an algorithm, but I've been thinking about this for the last few minutes. I don't think there is an algorithm because uh, different people take different paths to get into public health. And public health really means uh, uh, many different things as well. And one might argue even that uh, that you are a public health specialist and so is Prof. Rosina, and so is everybody listening into this call. Because the moment uh, we are engaged in, uh, shall we say, counseling for a patient, uh, that, that can be clinical medicine, of course, uh, but a lot of it is also public health education, education to the community and so on. So I'm, I'm not certain if there's going to be an, an algorithm of a specified steps uh, that you need to take in order to become a public health expert um, that, that is, shall we say, very effective in his or her work. But maybe I can answer the question in a slightly different way to say um, that the public health expert should be everyone as in public health should be everybody's business. Uh, so clinical medicine should also think about public health. The same way public health also needs to think about clinical medicine. So I might begin there that everybody should be a public health uh, specialist in their own way. The second thing I might think of is collect as many experiences as you can. And this is a message uh, over to um, all the medical students. Um, if you choose to be a surgeon, be the best surgeon you can be, but think about other non-surgical aspects of your practice. Um, and if you choose to be a public health physician, it's a great choice. Think about being the best you can, but consider that you cannot operate in a silo. And the more curious you are, the more, um, say, aware you are about uh, uh, subjects and uh, expertise that's outside your own narrow field, I think that would be very, very helpful. So in summary terms, be as curious as you can and uh, try not to stick in our own respective lanes only. So I might uh, offer these two thoughts uh, about how to become a good public health, especially the first one is that everybody might be a public health specialist. And secondly, um, the best experts that I have seen are deep in one area, but broad in others. So there's a bit of a T-shaped uh, uh, field of knowledge. And this is a very good generalist and specialist approach at the same time. Thank you, Marjorie. Thank you so much, Dr. Kaur. So there are a few more questions on global health. Is it okay if Dr. Kaur uh, remains with your mic on? So um, I will combine both of these questions. So the first question would be, has uh, the COVID-19 widened social justice and equity gap in the perspective of global health? And so what is your thought on clamping down on profiteering in the context of creating a global vaccine for COVID-19 and how to achieve the, the immunization you. equity for this case? Mm. Um, two great questions. Uh, first one's from Kyril Idham Ismail. Salam Kyril, terima kasih. Um, has COVID widened the social justice and equity gap uh, in the perspective of global health? Um, I'll begin by saying it depends on what you mean by social justice, what you mean by equity gap. Uh, but for the benefit of everyone, let me just uh, clarify that a little bit. Social justice, shall we say, is uh, are all human beings on earth equal? Uh, meaning the refugee from Afghanistan and Syria, is it equal to the farmer in Nepal? Is it equal to, I don't know, Mark Zuckerberg? There will never be perfect equality. And I think uh, we need to accept that the world will never be perfectly equal. I accept that. It's unfortunate, but uh, this is a fact of life. We should work to reduce the inequality. This is true. 
um, that if, if uh, social justice and equity gap uh, de is defined by the highest um, person in, in the human race versus the lowest, and that gap has always existed even before COVID. Your question is, has COVID accelerated this gap? Then the answer is yes. Let's take the example of America. America, if you are sick, you have to have health insurance because essentially the government will not pay for you. It, it, this is a simplistic statement here. Uh, but they have Medicare, they have Medicaid, they have many ways that the government does pay for you. So I'm not being truly uh, accurate over here. But let's use the example of America to say that uh, if you lose your job, you lose health insurance. So suddenly, 37 million Americans lost their jobs as a result of COVID. And when you have 37 million Americans, 10% of the population, losing their jobs and then losing their health insurance as a result, suddenly the gap widens, not only in economic terms, but also in health terms. So the short answer, that's a long answer to your question. The short answer is yes. The gap has always existed, it's accelerated. Um, allow me to move to the second question, everyone, uh, and Marjorie. It's from uh, Wong Ji In. I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Your question is uh, about clamping down on profiteering and global vaccine and immunization equity. These are three very large concepts. So it's not just profiteering in the sense of global vaccine and immunization equity, but profiteering everywhere. Private hospitals in Malaysia that charge a lot of money for face masks, uh, company, even traders that charge a lot of money for rice, if you want to buy rice just to cook, and they're already ramp, uh, increasing the prices. And the, what, are, what is the Malaysian government and other governments doing to um, prevent profiteering during a crisis? Because during a crisis, the private markets stop working. Prices will go up unless the government comes in to really control profiteering. So I would say it's not just for vaccines, but for every uh, medical equipment out there. Also, every, shall we say, bahan -bahan, barang -barang keperluan or essential goods. Um, how can we do this? Uh, the short answer for, uh, for immunization equity, and this is a very difficult one, is global collective action. When I say global collective action, if you write this term down and you read a little bit more about this, it is a problem of economics and it's a problem of politics. When two groups of people are coming together, they, all, they both have their own selfish interests. How do you balance these uh, two interests? And that is the uh, example, sorry, a definition of uh, what is the collective action problem. And then when you have multiple people with multiple interests, how do you resolve that? And this is a problem uh, from, um, that, that gives rise to the problem of profiteering. How do you resolve the problem of profiteering and to ensure immunization equity? We need a strong leader and that strong leader will have to be something like the World Health Organization or an organization with sufficient stature uh, that they can bring the multiple stakeholders together and get them to agree. Another example would be, um, unfortunately or fortunately, the US government or the European Union governments because they are still uh, world hyperpowers. And the third possibility would be a very neutral and credible NGO like a Gates Foundation or a Global Fund or a Gavi. And the, these are the three examples of institutions that can bring the world together so that we can achieve some form of an immunization equity. I, I love this term actually, so I might uh, actually use it in future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Kaur. So I'd like to add on for the question, yeah? So uh, there is, a question by fellow Hatim, a friend of mine. So he asked uh, if he can get Dr. Kors' opinion on the PATI parties in Malaysia, where healthcare is a basic human right for them, but their presence also engages the healthcare security of the others as the majority of cases are now coming from among their cluster. So how do we tackle this in a global healthcare perspective from your point of view, Dr. Kors? Thank you. Um, thank you, Hatim, for your question. It's a, it's a great question and a very difficult one to answer. So can I answer in three ways, small, medium, and large? Small ways in health. What do we do for the migrants right now? Perhaps a moratorium on arrests, giving them additional healthcare rights uh, in detention centers and also outside, providing them good housing. So the, the, there was an act passed by the Malaysian parliament last year that ensures good housing or better housing really for all the documented uh, foreign workers in Malaysia. That act uh, was passed in July 2019. It needs to be enforced right now and not uh, give employees a little bit too much time. The point I'm making is we can do a lot for health for the existing migrants in Malaysia right now. And those are three hyper-specific examples. Let me go on to the medium-sized solution. The medium-sized solution is to talk about the other 
um, non-citizens in Malaysia. And this is where I have to give you a bit of information. Uh, I worked with refugees for six years. Uh, there are 180,000 refugees in Malaysia, 2 million documented foreign workers, 4 to 6 million undocumented. How, how many undocumented workers do we have in Malaysia? We don't know um, because nobody's ever done a survey for this. What do we do with them? And the answer will have to include some form of repatriation back to their existing countries. Um, two days ago, uh, Malaysia announced that uh, together with the embassies of Indonesia and Nepal and the High Commission of Bangladesh, uh, these three countries, that they've agreed to assist the Malaysian government in repatriating the undocumented workers uh, back to their country. This is a very painful decision, but uh, it's a decision that I think um, could be the most balanced one and the best one under the circumstances. The borders of Malaysia will have to be secured for us to uh, protect the people in Malaysia right now. So if you're documented, then I think it's something that uh, we will definitely take care of you. We should take care of as many undocumented uh, foreign workers as possible, but also at the same time, uh, repatriate them back to their home countries. That's a medium solution. The large solution requires a rethink of Malaysia's foreign labor policy, also the world's migration policies. Um, here, um, I, I am afraid that uh, I'm not an expert uh, in uh, migration policies for the rest of the world. Migration has always been a fact of life. This is historical. There are political and geopolitical. There are economic and geoeconomic reasons for this as well, um, far beyond uh, the, the scope of uh, what I'm able to explain to you uh, and to everyone today. But my point is, um, if Malaysia does not have a, a rational, um, long-term migrant worker policy and border security and so on, then we'll always have this problem of uh, migrants coming into Malaysia. And this is something that Malaysia will have to plug into the global conversation about migration and refugees. In the next 20 to 40 years, we will see climate refugees as uh, the world becomes, becomes hotter and they, they lose water, they lose food, they will move from one country to another. We will have uh, a migration crisis uh, that will come upon us in the next 20 to 30 years if it's not here already. So that's the big solution. So there are some small things that we can do for health, but they're already very big, yeah? Small things for health for migrants in Malaysia. The medium term will be what to do for undocumented. And the, the very big one uh, would be Malaysia's uh, rational workforce policy plugged into the global migration debate. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Kaur. That was a very systematic approach to answer the yeah. question. I think I'll learn from that. Those are all difficult <laughs> questions. Yes. So small, medium, large. Okay. So thank you so much, Dr. Kaur. Uh, next, uh, can we have Dr. Nanshma to answer a few questions? They are more scientific, I can say. So it has been proven the infectivity is low after two weeks. Is it possible for the virus to replicate and become infectious again? Is there any study that suggests this? And what are the factors that influence the intensity of the infectivity of the virus. Okay, so um, actually we do not know up until uh, very recently that how infective, uh, uh, how infectious the virus uh, after two weeks. Uh, it's only very recent, about, about two weeks ago, then uh, more and more data come out and we decided that look uh, at 14 days and most likely it is no longer infectious. Um, um, sorry, where was the question again? Uh, uh, so, um, sorry, what was the question again? I, I lost the question. Can you read up? Oh, so whether or not people can become reinfected, right? Actually, um, we have come across uh, many patients who are like this. They're already negative and then they went back. And then after a week or at two weeks, uh, they went for testing and it becomes positive again. Some of these patients are actually still in a quarantine center or detention center. Some are at home and, and completely denying any risk exposure. Those who are at quarantine center may, may say that they probably, probably be exposed to somebody who's positive at the same center. But those who are actually at home, when we go through the history, uh, deny that they're actually uh, been having a new exposure because they're completely quarantined. Their food has been, been served by somebody else. They do not go out from the house. So how could they become positive again? So what does this being positive mean? Whether it means reinfection or redetection, or could it be just false positive in this kind of scenarios? So um, um, in, in so one way to know is actually by checking the antibody testing. 
okay, by checking the antibody. So if they have antibodies, so we probably can say that, look, this could be a, 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 a re, re, a, a re-detection because they, they already have antibody and it's just positive. And, and by now, we know that the virus can remain positive uh, in your PCR testing, in your throat swab. Uh, so uh, the duration of infectivity also has been proven. It is no longer effective by two weeks. I hope I answered the question. Yes. I'm so sorry, Dr. Nazra, because yeah. the question went into the, the dismiss section earlier. All right. Uh, okay. Yeah. So it's, yeah, I think the person the question. is asking yeah, whether it can be positive again after being negative. Right? Yeah. So those cohort that and the factors, yeah, the factors that influence the intensity of the infectivity after that. Hmm. Uh, sorry, Dr. Nazra. Yeah, so we have not looked into that. Uh, yep. Can you hear me? Uh, just now your line was cut off a bit. All oh, right. Okay. So yeah, I think I think that's what the question is asking. Whether or not once you become positive and then later you become uh, you're already negative and become positive again. So it depends on where, when you do the retesting. Okay, so if it's still within that six weeks, you may be actually just a redetection. Uh, but if it's beyond the six weeks, uh, you may have been reinfected. But whether this reinfected uh, means that you are actually uh, infectious, it depends on your serology testing. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Nashma. Okay. So uh, there is one last question for Dr. Kaur. Uh, Dr. Kaur, at 10.47 a.m., there was a question uh, given by attendee Ahmad Khaldun Ismail. So he asked if there is any study on the outcomes of countries adopting global health compared to those not. Thank you. I was just typing an answer to Ahmad Khaldun because uh, it's a really good question. Um, can I can I begin by saying uh, thank you? Uh, and secondly, to define what is uh, universal health. Universal health coverage or UHC, and, and this is something really worth Googling. It's a beautiful concept. Yeah. Um, universal health coverage means uh, health coverage to everyone who needs it when they need it at prices they can afford. So you get the care that you need at a time when you need it and at prices you can afford and doesn't make you bankrupt. That is universal health coverage. The question is, is there a study on the outcomes of countries that adopt universal health coverage? Sorry, you moved it to dismissed. Uh, oh. No, I yep. didn't. Oh, that's okay. Um, so, uh, sorry, let, allow me to continue with my question, yeah? Uh, with my answer, sorry. Um, I've defined you, what is universal health coverage. Um, these. Uh, is there a study on the outcomes of countries that have universal health coverage versus countries that don't? The short answer is no, there is no such study. Uh, but I'll let me elaborate on two parts of the answer. The first one is universal health coverage is separate um, from other measures that aid this particular pandemic, like social distancing, like lockdowns, policies on testing, tracking, contact tracing, and so on. So that's independent from universal health coverage, which is generally a method of financing. Um, so that is one challenge for why there is no such study. But number two, countries without universal health coverage will suffer more. And I'm saying this on the basis of no evidence, but okay, maybe there is one. The United States is not considered to have a country, it's not considered to be a country with universal health coverage. And they have a, a large number of infections, uh, a large number of deaths, and a large number of people who are unemployed without health insurance. Therefore, if they get sick, they have to give their own savings in order to pay for the test. Imagine that in the US, if you're not having insurance and you suspect you have COVID and you go to a hospital and you want to get tested, you will be asked to pay for the test and sometimes 200, sometimes 1,000 US dollars just to get a test. And this is before the consultation fees, before the medicines and so on and so forth. And that uh, um, lack of a universal health coverage would mean that the outcomes in terms of morbidity and mortality will be higher, morbidity higher because people could have the disease and they don't test it and therefore they go and infect other people. Mortality could be higher because you simply don't have the money for you to uh, access health care. So on the basis of no evidence, I'm asserting that universal health coverage is important to fight this pandemic. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Kaur. We really learned a lot today. Uh, just a personal question from me, Dr. Koff. So universal health and global health are two different terms, is it? They are. <laughs> okay, thank you so much, Dr. Koff. Okay, so I think it is, yes? 
uh, allow me if I can ask a question to Soba as okay, a yeah. representative of medical students. <laughs> sure, doctor. <laughs> Okay, so I just actually want to know um, what is your um, um, feel about coming back to hospital when there are positive patients in the ward. Uh, so, so you may be seeing on, the, on behalf of the rest of medical students because we have patients in the ward and we also have patients uh, um, in, in other wards who probably are not tested. So um, you all may be coming back for your clinicals and so on. And is this a concern to you all? Um, do you are you worried? Are you scared? Uh, you know how? Or maybe some of you might not be keen to come back to clinical. I just want to know. You know, what do you think? All right. Thank you, Dr. Najma, for the question. So, yep. um, um, personally, of course, I feel there's a lot more of our friends out there who are thinking that uh, we should actually go back to the wards, start practicing. We didn't have enough practices, like especially. Uh, uh, my group, I, I, if I can say, like we were in the internal medical internal medicine posting at that time, and oh. then yeah, so we we do not have that much of exposure in the wards. As much as we wish to actually go back to the wards, uh, I'm afraid that um, we actually can't go back because um, according to the uh, our faculty, so I think Prof. Zina would would be able to help with that. So they have actually said that. Um, we will still proceed with online teaching and also uh, we will, in case we go back after the um, MCO has been lifted completely. So even if we go back, we will be um, actually studying in the preclinical building and having um, like uh, simulated patients to practice our skills. That That's the decision made for now. But I'm not too sure about uh, what was the decision made for the year five students. So uh, in terms of the question, whether we will be afraid or not, uh, personally, yes, I think a lot of people are going to be afraid, like uh, even if they are going back to the wards and if the faculty allows so, people are going to feel uh, slightly anxious about going back because like you, you never know who is actually positive, who is not. And uh, so I think uh, it's up to us students to actually take the necessary precautions and also like uh, prepare ourselves for the worst. Um, just be prepared with all the masks, with all the sanitary sanitizers like personal you know all the whatever you should do just do what you can and then I think we will just leave it up to the faculty to decide what's best for us students because I think they're better to in, in that so yep all right thank you Sabana good to know the students insight yeah <laughs> thank you and uh, we, we are really looking forward to a decision from the faculty <laughs> So we can get ready and pack our stuff and go back. I left everything at college. Yeah. So <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you so much for voicing our thoughts. So um, before we end, just one last question. Uh, I would like to hear from all speakers if you have any mega plan in your mind right now, probably a collaborative effort of science, action, and manpower bracket medical students in this context. <laughs> so. Can we start with Dr. Najma, then Dr. Kaur and Savannah? Oh, from a uh, clinical and IV point of view, we always have things for you all. Um, <laughs> at least if you come back, you can actually uh, at least learn on how the proper don and doff and proper taking up PPE, you know, and practice the most important lesson in medical that people have forgotten, which is your five moments and hygiene. Okay, so project, uh, yes, you can you can help me at least analyze my data. I have this number of patients and data that um, you know I need someone to help me with. And we always come, come up with uh, ideas for your electives and your um, projects, yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Nashma. <laughs> okay, next, uh, Dr. Kaur. Um, as medical students, you have a responsibility to be the best doctors that you can be. Study as hard as you can, learn as much science as you can to do what you can right now as a medical student because that is your duty. But you also have other duties and the other duties would be in the form of a citizen of Malaysia and you have your duty to care for the people who are, uh, shall we say, less privileged, less fortunate, weaker, uh, less healthy and all that. So you have that duty as a citizen of Malaysia as well. 
eventually you will have a duty as a citizen of the world. And this is where I repeat my question. Um, there are very few Asian and Malaysian voices in the field of global health. As you build your career, I'd like you to consider this as one possible option. Uh, but then again, right? Be the best medical student you can, therefore be the best doctor that you can. And then after that, you can consider the next steps in your specialist career. I like I leave you with this these two thoughts, uh, fulfill your duties, firstly, as a medical student, secondly, as a citizen of Malaysia, and then thirdly, in the time to come, as a citizen of the world. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Kowei. Indeed, we see a huge injection there for, of inspiration today. <laughs> okay, so Bana. All right, so uh, as for me, I think for now, like what Dr. Ko has mentioned, our duty as medical student is to do the first thing first, which is learn. So I think in terms of learning, there's a lot of platforms out there. So make use of them. So like I have mentioned earlier, there's a lot of things um, on the internet where you can actually do in terms of global collaboration efforts. So um, make use of all of those. And also I would like to put out here, um, you know, like uh, I often hear from a lot of my friends from the uh, private university saying that, um, why is it always uh, public university students do not want to join in uh, a lot of things like uh, getting involved in some uh, decision making. Uh, I have friends from private universities actually uh, involved in policy making, uh, writing a lot of uh, write ups for the government and whatnot, and you know, uh, proposing ideas, organizing huge conferences. So, um, just to share my experience, when I was with the uh, Malaysian Medics International (MMI), so we um, it actually uh, widened my thoughts and it made give me the opportunity to actually work with a lot of people. And um, something that is very uh, significant in MMI is that we have uh, probably never met all of our members uh, at all. And we can actually uh, do something by just communicating online. We're just using Messenger and uh, WhatsApp. And we can actually put up a whole event. Like it just goes like, oh, mind blowing events like they have done. So um, something that is worth thinking about. So since we are all under this MCO, I think, uh, this is the opportunity for us to actually try out a lot of things out there and not limit ourselves because I think maybe because we were in the public universities, uh, we have a lot of rules and we have like back-to-back -back classes, probably not as, uh, I would say maybe our timetable is a little different from the uh, private students, uh, private university students. So I think this is the perfect time for us to actually uh, put ourselves out there, like what Dr. Kaur mentioned like you know like we have to put out our voices out there like Malaysian students especially so this is our time to actually um, put forward your ideas and also join as many uh, things that you can during this lockdown uh, resources are out there again so yeah that's my take for collaboration collaboration that you can actually do thank you Marjorie thank you so much so yeah. So um, time is running up and we have to put an end to this webinar. I'd like to thank all of the speakers today and all of the attendees for joining us today. I hope that everyone has gained tremendous input from the webinar today. And uh, if you may allow me, I'd like to end on a poetic note. Okay, <laughs> it's a short written uh, piece for myself. So uh, yesterday, life was made, we barely cared. Today, as we speak, we all learn before we earn. Tomorrow, when we meet, bye bye, COVID, fingers crossed, we will be spared. So, till we meet in person, thank you, everyone. I will pass it back to Prof. Lina. Thank you very much, Marjorie. And um, I just, it remains for me to thank everybody who's participated today. I'd like to thank our wonderful panelists. I think the super presentations, and uh, it was exactly what I was dreaming about for this webinar for our students. And for the students, I'd like to say we miss you too, and we wish you could be back with us really soon. Um, so I think one important thing that we've learned today is that we can all make a difference in our own way, no matter how big or how small. Oh. And that we need to- Yeah, if I don't watch this, I can Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, great. So um, as I was saying, um, you know, it's important that we realize we can contribute and make a difference and that uh, we need to work together to, to overcome this pandemic and to make this place, this world, which is incidentally our only home that we know, a better place for everyone for the future. So um, it's in our hands. We decide 
we move forward together collectively and we will overcome. So thank you very much. I'd like to thank the audience as well for the great questions. Thank you to the moderators, the panelists and the technical team behind. And we look forward to having you join us in our future webinars. Thank you very much. Assalamualaikum and goodbye. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Look